Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you. Uh, I know that there's been a lot of sickness going through the congregation. We've had a lot of weather and things. It's good to see each and every one of you here on the Lord's Day. Certainly so many thank yous to go around. Uh, I know Brock's done announcements a few times. Announcements is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> so <laughs> You get attacked from about 100 different angles. Uh, thankful for Brock doing the announcements. Uh, and I'm mindful as we switch uh, teaching quarters. Very thankful for those teachers that served last quarter, those teachers that are coming into this quarter. But uh, I don't want to forget anyone, but thankful for Melissa and Carrie. And i got to look over at the classrooms to remember, you know, the people in those spots. But Brandy, uh, Jacob, and Maxie, we're certainly thankful for all those that taught this past quarter. Uh, thankful for each and every one that, that takes part and helps us as we, we try to serve, we try to teach, and try to do the Lord's will. Uh, this morning we'll be looking at Philippians chapter 4, if you turn your Bibles over there. Uh, certainly, I think that there are keys to joy, and I think there are barriers to joy. I think there are things that get in the way of a Christian's life that can hold us back from having the joy that we should have. I think certain anxieties, certainly there's spiritual anxieties, there's physical anxieties, but many times anxieties get in our way of having the joy that we should have as Christians. I think negative thoughts and negative thinking many times are barriers for Christians to have the joy that we really should have. And I think sometimes sin is as well, is that sin will certainly weigh us down. And I think it's really hard to be at peace with God and to have joy in our hearts when we have a sin problem that we really need to sort out and deal with. If there's anyone that could really help us, I think, with this area of joy, I do think of the Apostle Paul. I think of the Apostle Paul and all the trials and tribulations that he went through throughout his life, shipwrecked, beat, all these things that he faced. Many times uh, challenges with the church, challenges with Christians, challenges with the world. So many things that came at Paul's life and yet he carried a joy even though he had so many exterior things that I think could have certainly snatched his joy away. I think anxiety could have taken the Apostle Paul's joy away. I think negative thinking could have taken the Apostle Paul's joy away. I think sin could have taken those things away. But I think Paul was very focused. He's very diligent I think Paul understood we have a battle in our mind that's going on and a battle of emotions. I'm not saying there's not going to be a time in a Christian's life where they're not going to be depressed or down or, or in a dark place. I think those happen in a Christian's life. I think those happen in a servant of God's life. But I think that we as Christians can bounce back quicker than the world can and that we should be actively waging this battle in our minds of joy really verse negativity. If there's anyone that could certainly help us, I think the Apostle Paul certainly could. Going through so many trials and tribulations. You know, we look at the Apostle Paul, an individual that was singing praises to God when he was in prison. Certainly many individuals would have fallen into the trap of looking at their exterior things that are going on, and they say, you know what? The anxieties are getting the best of me. I cannot sing with joy to God. You know what? Look at all these negative things that are around me. I cannot sing or have joy in terms of uh, uh, in my relationship to God. Or, or, you know, you think of that. If we could learn something, I think we could certainly learn something with joy from the Apostle Paul. I think we live in a negative world. I think there are many tragic things that go on. There are trials, tribulations, adversities, and certainly Christians are going to go through some of these downs of life. But I think we should be able to bounce back because of the joy we have in Christ Jesus. You know, I think it's interesting, if you look at statistics uh, from 2017 to 2023, they say that depression is on the rise in our country. And I, if I would think of depression for a few minutes, uh, you know, you think of depression, I think depression would fall on the opposite side of the spectrum of joy. I think if we're depressed, I think that would be far away from joy. And I think about that, why is our country becoming more depressed? Why are they becoming more negative? And I think many times it's because they've missed out on some of the keys to joy. I think they've many times have turned their back on God and have tried to live their life by themselves without walking hand in hand with God. I think God can help us with joy. I think God can help us with peace. And I think certainly the Apostle Paul showed that although we may face disease, although we may face disaster, Although we may face discouragement, although we may even face death itself, we can have a joy because of the God that we serve and the blessings that he grants to our lives. 
I think God loves us, and he certainly wants us to be at peace in this life and have joy. And I know God understands that we're going to have difficult times, and perhaps we'll even go through times of depression, but I think we can get out of those, uh, those, uh, those, uh, those valleys by holding on to the keys of joy. And certainly we are not going to cover all the keys of joy, but I think in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 13, Paul gives some very practical advice on how we can stay focused on things that are positive and keep the joy of the Christian life. Let's look at Philippians chapter 4. And keeping in mind where Paul is, and, and keeping in mind some of the hardships that he's faced in his life, Think of these things that he is writing to the church at Philippi. In verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And looking at verses 5 through 7, it says, Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the God uh, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I think there in those first few verses, we actually have one of the barriers to joy, and I think it's anxiety. And I think there's different anxieties discussed throughout the Bible, but I think if we think about anxiety and we think about peace, I think we're more at joy when we're at peace. I think we're less, we have less joy when we're very anxious. And I think God can help us with a lot of our anxieties. And Paul is giving a very practical instruction here. And I think perhaps if we would heed the Scriptures and take advantage of what the scriptures are saying here, what Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, I think Paul says, be joyous. And then as we look at the scriptures, he's saying, you know something that could perhaps steal your joy? I think he's saying anxiousness, anxiety. I think God is trying to take us, I know we're human beings and we struggle, but if you think of anxiety on this side and we think of peace on this side, God is going to want to take us to peace. Now I know as Christians, sometimes we struggle with these things. We are not perfect. Paul even mentioned some of the anxieties he has, and many of those are really spiritually focused, his concerns for the church, his concerns for his brothers and sisters in Christ. But I think God is trying to take us away from anxiety and lead us to peace. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. If we have that peace, I think it helps us to live a more joyous life. Certainly we're going to have trials and tribulations. But the Christian that is overly anxious is going to be the Christian that many times does not have the joy that I believe God wants us to have and have the peace that God wants us to have. There are a lot of anxieties that come at us in this life and Paul is giving some very practical, I believe, very inspired, obviously, advice. It says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. If you're anxious, pray. Now, there are many in our world, in our society, that will say, that will not work, that will not help me. Well, right here, the Apostle Paul, I think he's saying... Prayer will help you, is if you have anxiety and we're trying to get to peace, you know something that can help us travel there is prayer. I think somebody that prays more will be less anxious about the things of this world. You know what's so hard about many of our anxieties? Many of our anxieties are out of our control. I believe it, it was Jesus who talked about, you know, who by uh, praying or who by, uh, uh, you know, pleading for it can add one cubit to his stature. You know, we worry about sometimes these things that we have no control over and those things that we have no control over, eventually we have to get to a place in our Christian life where we say, I'm going to turn this over to God. I'm going to go to God in prayer and I'm going to turn this over. There are certain things that if we try to carry as humans, we will be crushed under the load. There are some things that are simply out of our control. Will you give them to God? Well, Kyle, that won't work. Well, that's what the Apostle Paul is recommending to the church at Philippi. He says, you're anxious. You're worried about these things. These things are, are tearing you down. These things are getting you down. He said, pray. And you know what prayer will lead to? Peace. We have anxiety. We pray. It leads to peace. Is it going to solve all things? We still, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and we'll look at a situation in the Bible where I think that applies. But we have to, at some point in our Christian lives, say, I'm going to trust God. And I think Paul had that. Paul could have had plenty of anxiety while he was in prison, but you know what? I think Paul got in his mind, 
all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Romans chapter 8 and verse 28. I'm sure Paul had some hard days in prison. I think he had some hard days of, of perhaps isolation at times, although sometimes we know that he was connected with individuals, brothers and sisters in Christ. But I'm sure Paul had some hard days. And you know what I think Paul did? He prayed. At some point in our Christian life, we have to give some things over to God or we are going to be crushed. But I think Paul had that mindset, is all things are going to work out. If I live the Christian life, all things will work out. I think sometimes we miss out that sometimes the trials and adversities that we face in our life are some of the best things for character building and increasing our faith. In James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it says, My brother, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience or endurance. Trials build your faith. When we go through adversity, when we go through trials, when we go through tribulations, when things happen to us, death, disease, when we go through these times, these are times for us to lean on God, to go to God in prayer and seek Him, and let God comfort us. Trials can build our faith. In fact, I think many times people miss out on when trials and adversity come your way, these are some of the greatest opportunities for us as Christians. Some of the greatest opportunities you'll have to be a light to the world is when you're going through adversity, when you're going through trials, when you're going through tribulations, when you're going through hardship. These are some of the best opportunities for a Christian not only to build their faith, but also to be a light to the world. To show the world how Christians who have faith, who believe in God, conduct themselves in such situations. Didn't Paul set such a powerful example? Paul could have been consumed by anxiety and all the trials as he was in prison. He could have been consumed by that. But we see in the Bible, at least on one occasion, that he was singing in prison. What an opportunity. See, many people would say, you know what, I'm in prison. I've got all this anxiety. I've got nothing I can do. I'm getting crushed underneath this. Paul, I believe, said, I'm going to pray and I'm going to be a good example through this. Paul was such a good example when he was in prison. In fact, he says, this ended up to be the furtherance of the gospel. He says, it seemed to encourage the brethren, but also I had an opportunity to preach the gospel while I was in prison. Anxieties can get the best of us many times. But we need to turn to God in prayer. You think you're not going to have troubles and trials and tribulations? Job said, man's days are few and full of trouble. Job chapter 14 and verse 1. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and excellent weight of glory. It says there, our light affliction, which is but for a moment. We're going to go through some affliction, uh, there's no doubt, on this life, in this life. We need to make sure that we are walking through this life hand in hand with God. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, it says, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. God wants to be with you through every trial that you go through in this life. God wants to be there hand in hand. And we have a high priest who can relate to us. In Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, it says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. When anxieties come, and they will. When you feel overwhelmed, and you will. Go to God in prayer. The world might say that it does no good, but I believe in the God of heaven, the God who created heaven and earth. That is the God that I serve, and that is the God that will offer help in the time of need. But do we make the call? Do we go to God in prayer? Let me show you an individual that was a follower of God. Most of us would acknowledge is a good quality follower of God, even though they had some mistakes on the record. Moses. You think Moses ever felt overwhelmed? That Moses had anxiety leading the children of Israel out of Egypt and them complaining the entire way. You think Moses ever had anxiety 
was overwhelmed, what did he do? He goes to God in prayer and he asks for help. Let's look at Numbers chapter 11. Numbers chapter 11, verses 11 through 15, we'll start with. This is Moses, the leader of the Israelites, has brought them out of Egypt. He's got to witness these plagues. He's a leader of the Israelites. And look at what Moses says. Numbers chapter 11, verses 11 through 15. It says, So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you afflicted your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you have laid the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I beget them that you shall should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a guardian carries a nursing child to the land which you swore to their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all the, these people? For they weep all over me, saying, Give us meat that we may eat. I may, I am not able to bear all these people alone because the burden is too heavy for me. If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now if I have found favor in your sight and do not let me see my wretchedness. Moses, a leader of God's people, overwhelmed, anxious. You look at those questions, those are powerful and deep questions that Moses is saying. He says, God, how am I going to feed all these people? God, how am I going to lead all these people? God, how am I going to do this? He has some soul-searching questions right there, and I believe he is really calling out to God. He says, God, I need help. I'm overwhelmed. I don't know how I'm going to feed all these people. I don't know how I'm going to lead all these people. I don't know how I'm going to do all this. This is overwhelming. I'm anxious. He goes to God in prayer, and he asks for help. And you know what? He actually makes some very dramatic statements towards the end, and I think the, his emotions are, are getting the best of him perhaps in this moment, but I'm not, not uh, in, acknowledging he's feeling this right now. Do we have any doubts that these are Moses' true feelings? How am I going to feed these people? How am I going to serve these people? How am I going to help these people? How am I going to take these people to the promised land? This is Moses. These are his raw emotions. And as he comes to a conclu conclusion in verse 15, he says, If you treat me like this, please kill me here and now. Moses just said, basically in a prayer to God, If, if it isn't improved... Just kill me. This is overwhelming. This is too much. I, I don't know if I can carry this, God. This is way too much. You think that you're better than Moses? You don't think you're going to have some moments in your life where you feel overwhelmed? Where the anxieties of this life get the better of us? You know what Moses did? He went to God in prayer. He pleads to God. He says, God, I need help. I feel overwhelmed. And you know what? God is going to provide help. Now, when God provides help, I think it can come from a number of different ways. Uh, but if you look at verses 16 and 17, help is going to come. It might not always come the way we expect it. It might not always come the way we want it. It might not always come on the timing that we desire, but help is on the way. Verses 16 and 17, it says, So the Lord said to Moses, Gather to me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tabernacle of meeting, that they may stand there with you. Then I will come down and talk with you there. I will take, uh, take of the spirit that is upon you and will put the same upon them. And they shall bear the burden of the people with you, that you may not bear it yourself alone. Moses says, I'm overwhelmed. I'm stressed. I've got all these things that I feel like I'm going to be, I'm going to be crushed. And God said, help is on the way. It might not always come the way that you expect it or the way you want it or the timing that you want it. But in this situation, God is going to have a little delegation that happens and the, there's going to be 70 men that are going to help Moses. Now, I did some quick math. The Israelites were easily, I believe, over a million people. If you take a million people and you divide it by 70, that's still 14,000 per leader here. <laughs> God doesn't make the work disappear. <laughs> There's still a lot of work to do. <laughs> 70 men, if you just divide that by a million, each one of these elders has still got at least 14,000 individuals that they're watching over. The work did not disappear. The task still had to be done. They were still tasked with getting these individuals to the promised land. They were still tasked with feeding these people, but not without God's help. 
and not the, without the help of each other. Anxiety can certainly get the best of us. When we look at Moses, I mean, you look at that. Perhaps you've said things like that similar in your life. God, I'm overwhelmed. God, I can't do this. God, I need some help. God, you know what? Moses even asked for death. There is an emotional battle in Christianity. There's joy and then there's anxiety. And I think that as we go throughout our life, we can like bounce back in between. But God wants us to get to joy. He wants us to get to peace. And certainly we cannot get there without prayer. And we see, I believe, that Moses does that in this situation. He feels overwhelmed, anxious, stressed, and he reaches out to God. Will you walk with God hand in hand? Or will you forsake prayer, one of the greatest blessings we have as a Christian? One of the barriers, I think, to joy is anxiety. Paul tells the Philippian church, you better be praying. And if you have some anxieties and stresses in your life, I would plead with you to do the same. Pray. I'm not saying it's not going to take faith, but I trust the God of heaven. The God that made heaven and earth to give the assistance that we need to go throughout this life. Will we trust in God and lean not on our own understanding, as it talks about in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 through 7. Let's continue in Philippians. Philippians chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And then we read that first section, verses 5 through 7. Now I want to read verse 8. It says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any... If there is any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. I don't think it's an accident in verse 8. We talked about in verse 4. Verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And I think Paul is going down through, and he's trying to tell these Christians, here are some things that can help you with your joy. Number one, pray. It will help you with your joy. When we get down to chapter 4 and verse 8, what is Paul trying to tell the church at Philippi? I think he's trying to tell them, think about positive things. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is anything, if, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Think on positive things. If you think on positive things, I think you'll be more joyous. You will be closer to the peace that God certainly wants us to have that so many times the world snatches us away. Do you think more on the negative or do you think more on the positive? See, I think the default of this world leads us to negative. We have to fight to be positive. We have to fight to have the peace. We have to fight to have the joy. And God gives us the tools, but if we forsake the tools that God has given us, God has given you a mind that you have a choice to focus on the negative or focus on the positive. I can almost guarantee you this. You focus on the negative, it will tear you down. Not only will it tear you down, but it will tear those that are around you down. Negative thoughts are dangerous. Negative thoughts will tear us down. Now, I understand that Christians are going to have periods where they think negative thoughts. There's going to be even maybe hard valleys in life where it almost seems like we can't keep the negative thoughts out. But Paul is telling the church of Philippi here, think on positive things. It will help you. It will lead you to the joy that a Christian should have. And I'm not saying it's an easy fight. We see many individuals in the Bible lose this fight for periods of time. I think Moses was one of them. I think he lost that fight. And then he says, you know what? I need to rebound. I'm going to pray to God and I'm going to rebound from this. I'm going to get some help and assistance and I'm going to rebound from this. And I think we can find other individuals in the Bible that do that as well. But do you understand that if you focus on negative things, it's going to steal the Christian joy. If you consume so much negative, it is going to tear you down. Think of these verses in Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 13. It says, A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. You want a broken spirit? Focus on negative things. You want to be cheerful? Focus on those things that are good. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 22. It says, A merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. Negativity will break you. And I would argue that Paul could have easily been broken in prison. We have got to see throughout the history of time people broken in prison. 
because they're isolated, because of all their external circumstances. But you think about that. We have the Apostle Paul. He's singing in prison. How can he sing in prison? Because he's praying to God and he trusts God. He's focusing on the positive. I think those are a couple keys to joy that Paul carried even when he went into prison. He said, I'm going to focus on the positive. Even though it's going to be hard some days, even though it's going to be a challenge some days, I'm going to focus on the positive. You know, focusing on the negative will break your spirit and it will break the spirit of those that are around you. Let's look at another Bible example. If you go to 1 Kings chapter 19. In 1 Kings chapter 19, we find Elijah, a prophet of God. Elijah, the prophet of God, he actually did some great good and, and, uh, as we read in 1 Kings. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4 is where I want to focus. But uh, Elijah, he has just done some great work with some false prophets in the land. But then Jezebel, it says, I'm going to go after Elijah. And basically, she starts kind of hunting him down. Now, when this starts to happen, Elijah is going to isolate for a period of time, and we're going to see how negative he kind of gets in this circumstance. In 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4, it says, But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life. For I am no better than my father's. Now when you read 1 Kings chapter 19, you're going to get the context. Elijah has done some great good, but he's got a lot of pressure on him coming from the government, Jezebel, and he feels a lot of pressure of those that are around him, and he's just overwhelmed. And you know in in 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 4, he says, it is enough. Now Lord, take my life. You don't think this is a battle that all Christians go through? The battle for the Christian joy that we should have? You know what I think happened is Elijah started to focus on the negative. He couldn't see the positive. He couldn't see the great victory that was just won. The great victory that was just won that he just went through. He couldn't see the victory. All he could see was defeat. All he could see was all the things that were going wrong. And as you continue, you see some of the other things that pop out in his mind. In 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 13 and 14, here's some other things he says. And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, tore down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Elijah couldn't focus on anything positive right now. He isolated himself. He was far away from other individuals. And I think for this period of time, Elijah was focused on the negative and he could not see the positive. And many times when we get in such a, a, such a state as that, is we cannot see the positive. And what a dangerous thing that is when Paul says one of the solutions for us having joy in our life is focusing on the positive, meditating on the good. Elijah is in a trap. He can't see any good. All he can do is see the bad. And and a lot of times when we get into this state, we're not even being fair. Because if you read down in 1 Kings chapter 19, God actually says there's 7,000 people still in Israel that are serving the Lord. Wait, wait, wait. Elijah said he was alone. (laughs) Elijah said, I alone am left. God, kill me. I'm alone am left. There's nobody else left serving the Lord. And you just read down in chapter 19, I think it's between verses 15 and 18, God says there are 7,000 individuals that are in Israel that are still serving the Lord. Now, is 7,000 a lot? I'm afraid it's not a lot when you consider all of Israel. That's not a lot. But there are some that are still serving the Lord. But sometimes we think so negatively, we cannot see anything else around. A lot of times we think our problems are unique to ourselves. We're the only one that feels alone. We're the only one going through this situation. No one else has ever went through this situation. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 9, it says, Resist him steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by the brotherhood in the world. Whatever you face in this life, this might not help you, But whatever you face in this life, someone has faced a version of it before. And I believe they have not only faced it, but they have been faithful to God. I think of Job. He loses his health. He loses his wealth. He loses his family. He loses everything. And he stays faithful to God. I know it's hard in those moments that we go through, those valleys of life. It's easy sometimes to drown in self-pity. And I think that's what's going on with Elijah. He's just so focused on the negative, he can't see anything. And you know what God has to eventually tell him to do? He says, get up and go to work. 
That's basically what he tells them to do. If you read down through 1 Kings chapter 19, eventually God says, Elijah, what are you doing? Get up and go to work. And you know what? That's many times what Christians need to do. Sometimes when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel stressed, when, when life is getting the better of us, we need to get up and we need to get back to work and do what God wants us to do. Because if we do that, I think we will be focused on those things which are good. The last thing I'd like to discuss is Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. So Paul says, you know what? You should pray. You know what? You need to be thinking about positive things. And in verse 9, I think there's another hint here of something that can help us with a joyous life. It says, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. You know, it might be simple, it might be basic, but in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, you know what Paul says? He says, do good and the God of peace will be with you. You know what? When you're not doing good, I think we lose the peace that surpasses all understanding. I think many times we lose the joy of the Christian life. We know many times whether we're doing what we're supposed to be doing or we're not. And you know what? I think it's hard to be joyous when we know we're not doing what God wants us to do. And you know what? When, we, when we're not doing what God wants us to do, you know what you call that? You call it sin. In James chapter 4 and verse 17, it says, Therefore to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. You know what helps me with Christian peace and helps me with Christian joy? When I'm doing what God has asked me to do. And when I'm not doing what God has asked me to do, you know what that is? That's sin. It's hard to have joy and peace in a situation such as that. You know, in Wednesday, uh, Rex has been doing a great job with Joshua. He's about to wrap it up. But in Joshua, there's one situation that happens in Joshua chapter 7. In Joshua chapter 7, they take Jericho, and they were given instructions not to take certain things from Jericho, but one man named Achan, he said, you know what, I'm not going to follow God's instructions. He takes a little gold, he takes a little bit of the garments, he buries these in his tent, they go on to the next battle, and you know what happens? The Israelites lose. Well, why do the Israelites lose? Because of sin. Sin, there's a great myth in our society that sin only hurts that individual. A lot of times you hear it in politics and it's kind of packaged up a certain way, but the idea is, oh, you're not hurting anybody else, it's okay. No, sin hurts the individual, it hurts the people around the individual, and it hurts the society. Achan, when he sinned and he took that stuff away from Jericho that he was not supposed to take, you know that men died in battle because of that. You know that later on Achan's family dies because of that. Sin affects all that are around. And you know what? When we're not doing right, that will affect your peace and that will affect your joy. You know what Paul says the solution is? These things do. It says, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. You know, sin is a barrier to Christian joy. And a solution to it is to do what God has asked us to do. You know, it's hard sometimes as we go throughout life, our emotions can get the better of us. But Paul is saying, pray. Pray. Think positively and do those things which are right, and those are keys to Christian joy. When I think about becoming a New Testament Christian, when you know that you have done what God has asked you to do, there is a great joy there. There is a great joy. And we see the pattern in the New Testament as individuals hearing the word, repenting, confessing, hearing the word, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. We see that all throughout the book of Acts. That's how individuals were becoming Christians in the New Testament. We'll go through many trials in this life. But it's better to face those with God, with prayer, with thinking about good things, and then also doing what God has asked us to do. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. We'd love to help you in any way we can this morning if you come as we stand and as we sing.